Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited to be here. This is my second time speaking at All Things Dopin. A little bit different than the first time, I will admit. Um, but loving it so far. I'm I'm thrilled that more conferences are doing remote stuff because I get to I get to do conferences without having to travel like crazy. So we're going to talk about modern cross-platform uh, with Ionic and Capacitor. Now, I want to make sure that the emphasis is not necessarily on Ionic itself. I want to put a lot more emphasis on the capacitor aspect of it, uh, so much so that I want to go through a little history lesson later on about uh, what capacitor is, why we've made it, what its goal is, and how it relates to other cross-platform solutions that exist out there. Like Orlando said, uh, my name is Mike Hardington. You can find me on Twitter, uh, at mhardington. If you have any questions, you want to see uh, pictures of my cats or some random furniture that I'm building, because uh, for side hobby, I build furniture. Um, quick little plug. Uh, I work for Ionic, and we're hiring right now. This is like a real fun opportunity. I've never actually gotten a chance to plug uh, my own hiring process. Uh, if you are interested in some new jobs, potentially, uh, jobs.lever.co slash Ionic. Uh, we got a few positions opening up, uh, and we'll have a couple more um, in the coming week. So definitely check it out if you are interested in a change of pace. I think it's a pretty good company. So. Let's talk about some of the high-level ideas that we're going to go over. Uh, one of the big ones is what cross-platform development is, why it exists, what are some of the history uh, behind it. Uh, we're going to look at the current landscape for cross-platform development. Basically, what are some of the projects that people use uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to create cross-platform apps? Uh, and then we'll dive into capacitor and look a little bit at Ionic, but mostly focus on the capacitor aspect uh, for uh, adding it to your project. So if we rewind and go back to roughly 2008, uh, this is when the original iPhone SDK was released. Uh, the iPhone had been out for a year. Uh, the promise was that instead of developing apps using some proprietary SDK, people would be developing apps uh, using the web. And if you were around using mobile devices or using the internet and being a web developer in 2008, you can tell, you you probably can guess that that was a bad idea. Uh, the web was pretty immature uh, and had a lot of rough spots. So after a year of the iPhone uh, being released, Apple's like, yeah, we're sorry, we're gonna scrap that idea. Here's an actual native SDK. Uh, the following year, as Android started to see its initial release, we got an Android SDK. Um, so between the two of these, we have roughly plus or plus one or two, uh, like close to a decade of native tooling experiences, if you know, give or take some time uh, in between there. So native SDKs have existed for mobile devices for quite some time, and they've gone through quite a lot of uh, improvements. So the native SDKs have their own package managers. They have their own build tool chain. They have their own IDEs. They have their own ways of doing things. Now, that's going to become important later on. But note that since these SDKs were released, there's kind of always been this inclination in these hackers who have been like, you know, I really did like that idea of using the web or using JavaScript, at least, to build my apps and deploy them to the app stores or deploy them to the web and just have features that the devices offer, like geolocation, Bluetooth, et cetera. So since these hackers have kind of always existed, uh, there's been ways and uh, ideas of how to get JavaScript and web apps onto these devices and behave like native apps. Now, probably the first one that has uh, done this is a project called Cordova or PhoneGap. If you've heard of it before, uh, we'll focus on the Cordova aspect of it as it is the, uh, the true open source version. Uh, and its mantra kind of is this write once, run anywhere uh, philosophy. Basically, I should be able to take my web app that I've written uh, using JavaScript. 
uh, been able to deploy to iOS, Android, uh, BlackBerry, Tizen, WebOS, all these various different platforms that they uh, supported back in the day, and it should operate in the same way. Now, I can't say for sure if this is the very first. I know that uh, in my research, it was the very first version of Cordova iOS was released after an iOS dev bootcamp, um, something around 2008. So I could be wrong. There could have been others that have done this before. But as far as I know, Cordova iOS dates back to 2008, roughly after the first SDK was released. The way that it works is that they embed a web view inside of a native app and then create this bridge layer for the web view to communicate with the native APIs. Now, how this works, we'll look at in a little bit. But this idea of a bridge and then a wrapper around your web app is going to become a common theme that we'll see uh, in the future. But its philosophy was that we should just polyfill these emerging standards and these emerging features coming out of the spec work. So things like the geolocation API, file uh, access, or the file reader API, uh, couple of a uh, couple of web uh, platform features that were still in early development. Cordova wanted to implement them, uh, following the spec at the time, to give uh, people a way to try out these features, use them in a production, and then either provide meaningful feedback to the standards process, or just you know use them until the standards process said, yep, we're going to ship this in production. Um, and then Cordova could remove any of the code that they used. I think the most ambitious goal that they ever had was to cease to exist, um, which, you know, if you want to get into some Eastern philosophy and the idea of uh, being able to remove yourself from existence, uh, that's a pretty, a pretty fun uh, goal to create for your own project. But the idea was that at some point, the browser is going to get uh, really good. And the need for Cordova or these uh, or uh, PhoneGap won't be there anymore. So they eventually could remove themselves from the equation and just use the web. From an architectural standpoint, Cordova operates uh, in a pretty simple uh, flow. In our little graph that we have here, we have our web app in this little blue uh, rectangle, which is loaded inside of a web view. Now, this web view is written in native code. So whether this is something like a web view in Android or web view in iOS, it doesn't matter that it loads all of this code uh, and basically displays the entirety of your web app in 100% of the viewport height and 100% 100, uh, 100 of the viewport width. So you basically are recreating your entire app's UI uh, using this approach. When they want to communicate uh, from the uh, web app to the native device APIs, there is this bridge layer that the web view communicates with uh, and sends data back and forth. So for instance, if you wanted to get your uh, location data from the native geolocation API. Uh, from the web app, you call uh, a method. The web view intercepts that method, calls the bridge. The bridge goes out and actually gets the uh, API, or gets the location data, sends that back to the web view, and then the web view communicates that back to the JavaScript app um, in a pretty nice pub-sub system of uh, passing data back and forth. Now, this is pretty simple. Um, it might not sound simple, but architecturally, the way that this works is pretty, pretty straightforward. Where I think some of the um, quirky parts are when they start to tack on different methods or different APIs to uh, JavaScript, to uh, global objects on, in JavaScript, that don't necessarily uh, exist anywhere else. For example, this is Cordova's camera API, where they say navigator.camera.getPicture. There's a success, a failure, and then a options parameter that we can use here. 
the navigator.camera.getPicture API doesn't actually exist in the browser today. Uh, so this is an example of Cordova polyfilling some, an API that doesn't exist in the browser or providing some sort of uh, mechanism for developers to call these features. Uh, nevertheless, we have this API. Uh, we can have our success and failure callback and then get the different options that we're passing around here, we're just setting the quality to 25, so a rather low quality image. Uh, and then we're setting the camera destination type to get a URL or a data URI. Uh, further on down, on success, whenever we get that image data back, we're just going to grab an element by ID called my image and then set its source to be the base64 string um, from our camera. And then on failure, uh, we'll just throw an alert. So pretty, pretty simple here. Um, this doesn't show a pretty unique quirk to Cordova. And that's if, if you want to do anything on startup, there's going to be some sort of delay. Um, when the native app gets instantiated, there is a there's like a handshake process that needs to happen between the web view and the bridge layer. And when that handshake doesn't have, uh, you know, if that handshake takes some time, um, there's no way for you to call native APIs or have them be queued up. So you need to listen for this event called device ready that basically says, all right, this event, whenever it fires, execute this method. Uh, so if you are working on a maps application using Cordova, there's going to be an implicit delay uh, automatically um, that could be as minimal as 500 milliseconds or something a little bit more extreme. I think the most I've seen was like five uh, second delay. Uh, granted, this was a large app on a very old device. So your miles may vary with this, uh, with, with Cordova, but the fact that there is the delay led to the idea that Cordova could be slow. Um, you know, take take what you want from that, but it's not necessarily Cordova that's slow, but the device that is slow. Nevertheless, with Cordova, um, times were pretty good for for about the first six or seven years, I would say. Um, they created uh, support for a ton of different platforms. Uh, there was iOS, Android, Windows, uh, but there was also BlackBerry, Tizen. Uh, Symbian, WebOS, all these various platforms that today no longer exist. Um, so we're left with iOS, Android, the big two, uh, Windows, Electron, and Mac OS. So if you need to develop a mobile app and then a desktop app, Cordova should be able to get you covered. The fact that they've existed for such a long time also leads to this huge community of third-party plugins. The way Cordova works is that they take every single API and treat it as if it was a third-party plugin or a package that you have to add to your project. So if you want to get access to the camera, you install a plugin and then call those APIs. Uh, if you want to say integrate Firebase authentication or Firebase analytics, uh, there is a Firebase plugin that you can uh, add to your project and then integrate with the native Firebase SDKs. Uh, there are some edge cases with this. Uh, one of the big ones is that there are multiple versions of some plugins, uh, which can lead to interesting questions of which plugin should I use? Or if I need to use X, Y, and Z for my plugins, um, is that gonna cause any conflicting uh, install or build failures with these other plugins, uh, which, which does happen. Uh, now, it's not a perfect setup. Uh, there are a lot of custom uh, scripts that are being run in order to do everything. Mind you, back when Cordova was created, there was no NPM. There was no node, uh, node modules. There was no yarn. There was, just, there was no node to begin with. There was a lot of things that were originally done as batch, uh, bash scripts for Linux, and then, uh, batch scripts for, for Windows. Uh, they've since moved over to uh, a node-based uh, setup, but still there are custom scripts that have to run for every single project, uh, which could be a lot of overhead for developers to maintain. Um, 
And if something happens to break, which you know occasionally does happen, you're now left to figure out, okay, where did this break? How do I contribute back to fix to this? Or how do I let people know that this broke? If you're trying to add features to a native project, well, chances are you're not going to be keeping that native project around for long. Uh, the way that they look at it was that no one should ever have to open up Xcode or Android Studio. Uh, and for a little bit, that was okay. But when these native platforms start changing how uh, features get added, for example, push, push notifications, uh, there's an entitlement that you can add in Xcode where it's basically just clicking a box and it enables push notifications for your, for your app. Going back to the second first point, there's a custom script to add push notification support that needs to run if you want to enable push notifications. So having the custom tooling, having the projects that were meant to be destroyed or blown away every time you uh, build your project, there's just it, it's a feedback loop of just, okay, well, we're going to add this project to our app. Uh, we need to enable push notifications, so let's run the script. OK, so that needs to get run every single time. It, it leads to some confusion. Um, not only uh, with that, but if you set up uh, your signing certificates for your native projects, that can also be confusing. Now, the last part, I don't want to say it's a, 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 a big minus one, but it's something to be aware of, is that the overall project health of Cordova, um, you know, is in question right now. Um, most of the major corporate contributors, uh, Adobe, Google, Microsoft, they've all stopped contributing to the project. Uh, it's part of Apache, but now that still just uh, a few developers here and there in their free time maintaining it. There's no corporate steward. There's no people dedicated to just supporting this project. It's just people doing it in their free time. So if you are a company or if you're a startup trying to build on something that's going to last for uh, 10 years or so, Cordova may not be that, that thing. OK, so that's enough about Cordova for now. Let's kind of look at React Native um, and similar projects. Uh, and the way I like to think of this is that this is uh, JS to native, basically any app that lets you write JavaScript or some language and then run it in an embedded native uh, environment. So this would include things like Flutter, um, obviously React Native, uh, and a few other projects that exist out there. So they, they saw what was happening with Cordova and they thought, okay, well, why don't we do another approach of if you learn this basic API, you should be able to write an app that runs anywhere or write for any different platform. Uh, this, this is more of a React Native mantra of write, learn once, write anywhere. But they still follow this philosophy of being able to give you a truly native app. Um, and I'm going to, there's a reason why truly native uh, is, in air, is in quotes there, um, as, as we'll look at it. But they give you an abstraction around building out these native controls. So when you are, uh, building out your app, you're either running something in like JavaScript for React Native or Dart for Flutter. Uh, and then at runtime, they'll generate all the UI uh, for your app. So for React Native, they'll actually generate uh, native UI on the fly. For Flutter, they actually have their own VM that just recreates all of the native UI uh, in, in Dart because, um, but they give you this promise of you're going to get a truly native app. Now, as we go further along, uh, the architecture for this is actually pretty similar to um, uh, Cordova, where we have this JavaScript app that runs inside of a, uh, a VM. For React Native, in this case, we're looking at V8 or JavaScript core on iOS. And then it communicates back and forth with this bridge layer. Now, as they communicate to the bridge layer, it talks to the device APIs, feeds that back to the VM, and that feeds it back to the app itself. So 
So it's a similar architecture of how everything works. Uh, further along into it, we have our uh, kind of hello world for React, where we're just building out a component that renders uh, what is essentially a glorified div and a paragraph tag, but is an abstraction around the native UI here. Um, now, something that I will note is that if you want to do anything probably really compelling with React Native, you're going to want to use a third-party project. Uh, in this case, something like Expo. Um, big fan of what they're doing over there. Uh, for in this case, if we want to just get a camera feed into our app, we can just import camera from Expo and run that into our app. Uh, now, that's nothing uh, too complex. Um, just it abstracts around all the UI and all the native uh, setup that you would have to do. Now, uh, the downside of this is that if these, most of these projects are driven by corporate development needs or corporate, um, uh, or just corporate development in general. So Facebook is a big proponent of React Native because Facebook uses React Native. Uh, Google's a big proponent for Flutter because they use Flutter in certain cases. Um, if for some reason these projects are no longer needed by their companies, what's to say that these projects are going to exist for the future? Who knows? Facebook could drop React Native and say, yep, we're, we're no longer maintaining this. And how's the community going to uh, step up? being that these projects are also still relatively new, there's a smaller community set here. Uh, people who are working with React Native have limited choices of where they can get support, where they can get third-party plugins, um, and just left to their own devices, which leads to multiple plugins that do the same thing, uh, but sometimes in less than ideal, um, uh, in a less than ideal quality. So you get plugins that don't really do what they're supposed to do, or they do what they're supposed to do, just with a lot of performance uh, being dropped. And if you do need to write a plugin for this, well, you're going to actually need to write native code. Um, they don't actually remove native development needs from your tool set. They just kind of put it off until later on. And there's this really great blog post from uh, that kind of sums up why Airbnb and uh, Udacity abandoned React Native. Um, and it's going to sound like I'm picking on React Native, but kind of am. Uh, if you go to short URL at slash p capital D G zero one, uh, it kind of goes over why these two companies left uh, React Native to just go fully back to native development. Um, there's a lot of pros and cons for this. Read through it, make your own opinions. But uh, I think the best way that they could sum it up was, it's not as cross-platform as advertised. You basically are maintaining separate projects. So with all of that, what makes Capacitor a difference? Um, this is our, uh, our uh, Ionics approach to solving uh, cross-platform development needs, but takes a lot of inspiration from Cordova and things like uh, React Native or uh, even other projects like NativeScript. So uh, in a nutshell, Capacitor is a native wrapper for getting your web app into the uh, App Store and a JavaScript library for accessing native device features. If you wanted to say integrate with a uh, geolocation, Bluetooth, file system, local notifications, you import this JavaScript API, and then that will automatically map back to these native features. When you want to integrate, say, with something like a third-party uh, native SDK, you're just using that uh, native SDK in your project or providing a plugin API that can uh, call that, AP, uh, that SDK natively and provide a fallback for the web. Architecturally, this is pretty similar to Cordova, where we're still loading things up in a web view. We're still having that. Um, bridge layer that communicates back and forth, but we do things pretty differently under the hood in the way that this is set up. So uh, one of the big ones that I think um, separates Cordova for, uh, Capacitor from other projects is that it loads instantly. We pre-connect that 
bridge layer and the web view layer um, right, right at the app creation time. So if you need to get geolocation data like right as your app starts, you can do that. You don't need to wait for some uh, connection. Uh, different, uh, something different from React Native is that we don't focus on UI. In this example, I'm going to be looking uh, at building something with Ionic, but if you don't want to use Ionic and if you want to use something like Angular Material, React Material, Vuetify, uh, you can still use that with, uh, without having any issues. It's also framework agnostic. Uh, and under the hood, it uses native best practices, things like um, CocoaPods, Android libraries for maintaining uh, uh, dependency updates. It's making sure that it's doing the best that it can to follow these native best practices. Now, it's also got a quote unquote aggressive version support. Um, depending on who you ask, cutting off Android 4.4 might be a very aggressive thing to do. Uh, we don't think so because that is still like 90% of Android users. For iOS, you can push back further, I found out yesterday, uh, than just N minus one. You can go all the way back, I think, to iOS 11, though there's basically no one on iOS 11. So for this, you know, you can get iOS 14, 13, maybe iOS 12 too, uh, but check your analytics, see if you even need to support that. So let's actually take a look at how this works. So I have an app here. And instead of running I serves, do npm run start. Uh, it's a React app. Um, not that that really, really matters, but it's just going to show you how to actually uh, get these projects up and running. So Let's go into, well, yeah, we'll go into tab one. This is an Ionic app as we are looking at it. Uh, we have this tab-based UI down here. Uh, nothing too complicated for, uh, for, for the setup. This is literally just something that you could start and pull in um, from the Ionic CLI. What we're going to first uh, do is import something from If I can type uh, at capacitor core, we're going to pull in from the core capacitor library, and we're going to pull in this plugins uh, object, which is just going to be our way of accessing the native APIs. So inside of our component, we're going to delete this, and we're going to render an ion button, and we're just going to say, get location, we'll import this from, from Ionic itself, and then I'll render out an H1, and I'm just going to do json.stringify, um, we'll say lock. Now, lock's not going to be something that's defined yet, so let's go ahead and define that. We'll come up to the top of our component, we'll just say const uh, lock set lock is going to equal use state, and we'll just pass in an empty object here, uh, import that from React, and then we're going to need a way to call this plugin. So we'll just say on click, and we will call get location on click. So nothing should seem to uh, out of place here for a React app. So let's say uh, const get location is going to equal a function. Uh, inside of this, we'll just say const equals plugins. And we're going to destructure some stuff away from uh, plugins. So we'll destructure uh, geolocation. And we're going to say const uh, results equals, again, if I could type, uh, await geolocation dot get current position. Now, since we are using await, we can just mark this as async. If we want to just check what this is going to uh, render, we could just console.log our results. But really, we just need to say, uh, set lock is going to equal res dot 
coordinates. Uh, we don't need a timestamp. Uh, you could probably use it in your app somewhere, but we don't really need to worry about it too much. So we'll hit save. And then we're going to come over to our app. And just to make sure that this all works, we are also going to put that down here and say get location. Yes, it wants to know my uh, location. So that works great. We'll call again because sometimes the data doesn't uh, like to work that way. Why does it not want to re render? Doo, 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 doo. All right, don't know why it doesn't want to re-render, but whatever, that's probably just my React foo failing. Anyway, we can come over here. We can see that we're getting this location data. We can see that we're getting the longitude and latitude. Uh, so if we want to build out some kind of location-based application, we could totally do this without any issues. Where this really, uh, where this really um, becomes fun is as we start to come down to our app, we can do a quick little uh, uh, build here. So we'll just do npm run build. And this is just going to run React scripts to build our application. We can actually use Capacitor here to deploy it to uh, an iOS simulator. So I've already installed Capacitor. Um, if we want to install it, we can just do npm install at Capacitor uh, core and Capacitor CLI, since that's already been done. Uh, we would run npx cap uh, init, and that's going to create our project for us. All that really is creating is this capacitor config, which is going to set up the different fields for our application. So this will give us our package name, the app name itself, uh, basically where should we be pulling our JavaScript uh, code or our web, web app, what NPM client we should be using. And in this case, we're just going to use NPM. Uh, and then some plugin configuration for our project itself. Uh, that doesn't matter too much. We could add a new project. We could do cap add. Uh, in this case, we'll, let's add Android. Uh, so this will go through and install Android dependencies. Uh, we'll see how long this is going to take. Hey, actually, it didn't take that long. Uh, and then we could automatically open up, say, Android Studio and deploy it from here. Uh, I already have uh, iOS opened up. So we can run npx cap open iOS to just open up the native workspace. Oh, awesome question. Awesome comment. I see in the chat that lock is the same object in uh, object script. If I don't re-render, try putting in the lat. Good, good suggestion. So let's create a new object for uh, const. Uh, location data equals an object where we have, uh, you know what, let's just do this. Lat res dot coords dot lat latitude and long res dot coords dot longitude. And you know what, let's, obviously we need to close that out. NPM run start. So hopefully that's all that it is. Uh, thank you for the comment, uh, Nikolai. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I love getting feedback and uh, tips from the uh, from the audience as I'm doing as I'm doing everything. So just to show that we're doing this live. Uh, so we'll do NPM run build again. And since we've changed our build here, um, and we've actually uh, changed what the output is, we actually need to sync this back with Capacitor or to our native project. So Capacitor gives you a command to do this, npx cap sync. Uh, and you can pass in an optional platform to target. So we're just going to sync our iOS project 
Uh, so this will go through, update all the data dependencies if there's any changes, and also bring in the new changes to our web project. Um, make sure to do this pretty regularly. So we'll go over to our project here. This is the native SDK. Um, if you've never opened up Xcode before, don't be too afraid. It just looks like uh, the old version of iTunes. We just have this little play button up here that we can click and deploy to our simulator. Uh, this is just going to deploy to the iOS sim. Uh, we can see that the app is loaded really quickly. Uh, and we can start to say, uh, get location data. It's going to prompt us with the native location features. If we actually come over to, yeah, Apple. Let me sure we click that. Click get location. Things that want to work well over here, we might actually have to deploy to Android. Oh no. Okay, so we're gonna deploy to Android because iOS doesn't want to work for me. MPX cap copy Android. That's actually much quicker. MPX open Android. Uh, luckily, I've opened up Android Studio in the past couple weeks, so I don't have to go through any updates or um, changes to the project. So everything should, in theory, just work. We'll let it do its thing. Kind of wait patiently, panic only a little bit. Close that, don't need any of that. You can tell I've opened it recently because the Android emulator actually started up pretty fast. Native projects launching. Awesome. Let's try getting the location again. All right. Allow this app to use the demo. So we're on a native device, so we should get native prompts to allow for certain features. In this case, we're just going to allow uh, while using the app. And we can get our latitude and longitude. Um, I don't know actually which what location this is spoofing, but it's a latitude and longitude for our uh, for our user and however this app works. Uh, if we want to deploy this, we could actually just deploy the Android app and the iOS app to the app stores, and then also deploy the web app to something like Netlify, Firebase Hosting, um, Vercel, what have you. So in a short amount of time, we've created a native app that gets my location. Uh, we have a web app that gets my location, and if iOS was behaving well, we'd have an iOS app that gets my location. So uh, said, what about the, uh, we just went through the demo, the web version, if we want to do this, uh, we're basically just building a progressive web app at this point, giving you all the features that you would need to uh, get you know, basically 100% on Lighthouse and build out uh, some pretty awesome features. If you needed something additional like native like UI, uh, Ionic is a great option here. And we also have the third party project called PWA Elements, which gives you the uh, features and the UI for things like a camera control or for modals and overlays. Um, that's optional if you don't need it. So install it if you want, but pick a good UI library. Ionic is a great one. You don't have to use it, but you can use something, uh, something else that's out there. So if you don't have a brand new project that doesn't uh, made with Ionic, which we give you capacitor by default, again, you can install it using NPM or Yarn. Uh, just install it as any other dependencies and then run MPX cap init or Yarn cap init, and that will give you the entire project structure. So it's kind of been a whirlwind tour, but I do want to just leave it with you with some thoughts. Cross-platform itself is basically just about reducing the amount of code that you as a developer need to write. If I can get my location data using one API that works on all multiple platforms, that is effective cross-platform. I don't need to change how that API works 
it knows how to change it itself. Capacitor essentially gives you a web-based API that can work in native as well as obviously the web. When we're working on the web, we're just going to use the standard web API features. When we're on native though, we're going to give you the entry points and the uh, native implementation to handle things like geolocate uh, permissions and um, prompting users to allow for certain features. So I hope that kind of covers a lot of capacitor uh, and gives you some, you know, some food for thoughts. If you have any questions, I'd like to uh, take them now. Otherwise, you could go to capacitorjs.com to find out more, or you could tweet at me, mhardington, uh, if you have any questions for later on. But thank you so much.